my apologies. I usually run over. But I beat you. Yeah, couldn't run. Had to take elevators and all that kind of stuff. All right. Welcome to today's hearing of Energy and Commerce. All right, we're on. Oh, the script. Everybody take their, their seats. Got to follow the script. Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations will now come to order. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for an opening statement. All right, back to where I was. Welcome to today's hearing on the Energy and Commerce uh, Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations. Today, for the first time, this committee welcomes the head of the Department of, the, of Energy's new Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains, or MESC. In February of 2022, as part of the department's newest reorganization plan, three new program offices, including MESC, were created. MESC was set up with the goal of strengthening energy supply chains and increasing the domestic manufacturing base. This is intended to support what the DOE characterizes as a clean and equitable energy transition. MESC is currently administering about a dozen programs funded through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. Almost all of MESC's programs have been created recently. In short, a brand new office will give out billions in funding for numerous new programs over the course of just a couple of years. Now, I don't care what party you're in, this scenario, no matter what the department or the administration, deserves increased oversight. Not long after its creation, MESC came to the attention of then Republican leader Rogers and myself after it announced $2.8 billion in financial awards to 20 companies under its Battery Manufacturing and Recycling Grants Program in October of last year. As a part of these announcements, Microvast Incorporated was selected to receive a $200 million grant for a battery manufacturing plant in Tennessee. Shortly after the announcement, Microvast's association with the Chinese Communist Party became apparent. Microvast produced its battery components in China. The bulk of its revenue was generated in China, and according to Microvast's own SEC filings, the government, referring to the People's Republic of China, quote, exerts substantial influence over the manner in which we must conduct our business activities and may intervene at any time with no notice, end quote. After learning of Microvest's concern, concerning ties to China, then Republican Leader Rogers and I sent a letter to Secretary of Energy Jennifer Granholm on December 14 of last year requesting a briefing to include specific information about the Microvest award. The department has yet to answer our specific questions, provide any documents or sufficient information about the vetting processes behind the Battery Manufacturing Recycling Grant Awards. In response, we asked, with two weeks' notice, that the appropriate official from the DOE testify before this subcommittee on May 23rd. Unfortunately, the department refused to attend, citing inadequate time to prepare. However, strangely enough, the night before the hearing, the department announced it was canceling its tentative award to Microvast. It is unclear whether these events are related. To date, the department has still not shared with Congress the reason for this decision or any details of additional due diligence the department may or may not have, have conducted. We had an informative discussion with witnesses who did join us on May 23rd to talk about general challenges facing our energy sector supply chains. The witnesses talked at length about threats posed by foreign rivals to our secure energy security, including government programs. The main point is we don't want Chinese companies getting American taxpayer money to create more Chinese jobs and Chinese technology, even if some of those jobs might end up being in the United States. My colleagues and I have lots of questions on have, have lots of questions only the Department of Energy can answer. MESC's goal is to boost domestic, domestic industry and secure energy supplies. However, the microvast misstep has increased our doubt as to whether this mission is being successfully completed out. While I commend the office for canceling the microvast award, it shouldn't take a news story and multiple congressional letters for MESC not to award grants to problematic companies. The main cloud of haze here concerns due diligence and vetting processes at the DOE. We are aware of at least one other selectee besides Microvest that is also no longer moving forward with the awards process. The detailed reason for Amprius grant cancellation is unknown. While we were disappointed in the department's refusal to originally participate in our hearing last month, I am glad to finally have 
them here today. As such, we welcome Dr. David Howe, Principal Director, Deputy Director of MESC. Mr. Howe has previously served as MESC's Acting Director as well as Director of the Vehicle Technologies Office for the DOE. Today we hope to learn more about this new office. The, this committee also hopes to gain some insight on how it is prioritizing its awards and how seriously it takes its domestic manufacturing charter. I thank Principal De Deputy Director Howell for joining us today, and I look forward to our discussion. And with that, I yield back. I now, rec I now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Ms. Castor, for five minutes for her opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this important hearing. Welcome, Dr. Howe. Look forward to hearing your testimony. Uh, we continue to hear good news about opportunities that are emerging across the country thanks to the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act and, of course, the Chips and Science Act. These laws are already having an incredible impact, creating good-paying jobs, lowering energy costs for our neighbors, and bringing manufacturing back to the United States. These investments are smart. They are accelerating the use of American-made clean energy that is cheaper and more sustainable, and shifting away from supply chains controlled by foreign adversaries like the Chinese Communist Party, and we are freeing ourselves from big oil companies and utilities that keep fuel prices high and put profits over people. Through our targeted investments, we're building a clean energy economy that benefits everyone. Today, we have an opportunity to learn more about implementation of parts of the IRA and the infrastructure law at the U.S. Department of Energy. The Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Change, or MESC, is a new office tasked with managing some of the crucial investments that Democrats made last Congress. MESC oversees initiatives to boost critical minerals, to process minerals in the U.S. rather than China, to manufacture batteries in America, uh, and recycle those batteries here. Meanwhile, local workforce development initiatives, apprenticeships, are also underway so workers can learn updated skills and trades. Because we've got to make sure that American workers are ready to take advantage of career opportunities created by these investments. That's why Democrats included so many Buy American and Build American policies in the IRA and the infrastructure law. And good news, it's working. The IRA and the infrastructure law have already attracted over $240 billion in new investments across 31 states, like new battery plants, electric vehicle manufacturing plants, 142,000 jobs created so far, and these are good paying jobs that often do not require a college degree. We're strengthening communities at the same time. So it's a little ironic that most of these investments in jobs are happening in areas represented by Republicans who oppose the IRA and the infrastructure law. But that's okay, we're all in this together. And I trust that over the next decade, businesses and companies will invest more to support new manufacturing in the U.S. and modernize our infrastructure. That will give our neighbors back home more stability and security. It's important to recognize that offshoring manufacturing jobs and supply chains did not happen overnight, and bringing them back will not happen overnight either. For decades, the Chinese Communist Party poured resources into their manufacturers to build an early lead in the global clean energy supply chain. America did not make the same investments, which resulted in missed opportunities. But we're making up with, for that now with smart, long-term investments in critical mineral production and processing and advanced manufacturing. These investments and American ingenuity will not only allow us to catch up to the CCP, but will make us the world leader in clean and renewable energy, uh, new electric cars and trucks, and industrial manufacturing to lower climate pollution that is wreaking havoc, in our, wreaking havoc back at home in our communities and costing our neighbors a lot. Thankfully, DOE is no stranger to managing and mitigating investment risk. MESC uses a rigorous and efficient vetting process to comprehensively analyze project-specific risks and tailor measures to mitigate those risks. 
MESC continues to conduct the proper due diligence uh, to protect taxpayer funds, and it's working how it should. Unfortunately, I don't think my Republican colleagues agree, and I'm concerned that they have already given up on supporting American workers and competing in the global clean energy supply chain. Just last month, Republicans held a hearing where they simultaneously expressed uh, satisfaction about Microvast's rejected application and skepticism that the United States could never compete with companies that are beholden to the Chinese Communist Party. Well, it's, it's disappointing after years of complaining about our country's reliance on the CCP that Republicans are betting against investments in the future and against American workers and manufacturers. Instead of trying to find ways to undermine important federal programs or holding our economy hostage through ma a manufactured crisis, let's turn the page and work together to help our neighbors back home and the American people. Together, we can do the constructive oversight that helps fed federal initiatives succeed. Unless we invest in our future, we will continue to fall behind and miss yet another opportunity to be a leader in clean energy, energy supply chains. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Chairman Lee yields back and now recognize the chair of the full committee, Ms. McMorris Rogers, for her five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We should all be proud that America is the leader, the leader in clean renewable energy. We've done more to lift people out of poverty. We've done more to reduce carbon emissions than any other country in the world. And we've done it through American innovation and technology. It's not China. China continues to build two coal fire plants every week. That's not the future that I want in the United States of America. We should all be able to agree that our country must have a stable, secure supply chain, though. It is a matter of national security. We've seen the consequences of over-reliance on supply chains from adversaries. It's playing out in Europe, where Putin has, put, has weaponized Russia's control over the continent's natural gas supply. That is our future if we continue to cede our energy and supply chain security to China. That's not the future I want, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, President Biden's rush to green agenda puts China more firmly in control of our energy supply. This weakens American energy and national security and wastes American taxpayer dollars, which should be going to supporting more American jobs and innovation. Beginning in March of this year, we requested that federal agencies, including the Department of Energy, provide monthly accounting of the funds they received under these major spending bills last Congress, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. To date, we've received one response from Department of Energy, and it was incomplete. That's unacceptable. We are the Oversight Committee, and we are the elected representatives of the people. Furthermore, on March 29th of this year, this subcommittee convened a hearing with three inspectors general to discuss the risk associated with the Biden administration massive spending spree. According to the Energy Department's Inspector General, Department of Energy received $128 billion in authorizations and appropriations and an estimated loan authority of more than $350 billion. And this, this, this is uh, uh, the IG also testified that under the IIJA, the IRA, $83.6 billion will be going into 71 new programs at the department. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you heard that right. 71 new programs. To understand how massive this spending plan is, it's helpful to point out that Department of Energy's fiscal year 22 budget was $44.3 billion. What I found most concerning is that the Inspector General warned that new programs pushing money through untested processes and newly implemented internal controls are especially vulnerable. According to the Department's estimates, Energy Department's estimates, the Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains, which has only existed since February 22, will administer $12 billion a portfolio of projects under the IIJA and the IRA. I have serious concerns about a brand new office having the procedures and the staff in place to distribute such a gigantic sum in a responsible way. And these concerns have only intensified in recent months. Under one of the programs, the Battery Manufacturing and Recycling Grants Program, the department announced it had selected Microvast to receive $200 million 
We now know Microvest performs the bulk of his battery production in China. According to the company's own SEC filings, and I quote, the PRC government exerts substantial influence over the manner in which we must conduct our business activities and may intervene at any time and with no notice, end of quote. It's deeply troubling that a grant for hundreds of millions of American hard-earned taxpayer dollars was approved for a company like Microvast. And so that is why last December, Chair Griffith and I wrote to the Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, and requested more information on this grant, as well as the procedures and the processes that led to the selection of Microvest. While it's true that the department recently decided not to move forward with the Microvest grant, it remains unclear how the grant was approved in the first place. Time and again, we've requested information and testimony on how this has happened. And then time and again, the department has failed to be accountable and transparent. This lack of transparency undermines the public's trust and raises doubts as to whether or not we are safeguarding taxpayer dollars. Americans deserve to know what the department is doing to screen applicants, scrutinize their foreign ties, and keep funding that is supposedly supporting domestic ind industry from enriching our global adversaries. We must have transparency, and we must be assured that these taxpayer dollars are not being funneled to the Chinese. And we're going to continue our work to demand transparency and accountability on this. Since day one, my colleagues and I have led to celebrate American innovation and energy dominance, and we're continuing that efforts today. This is just another step in that goal. Mr. Hall, I appreciate you being with us here today. I look forward to hearing more about the new program office. I yield back. General yields back. Now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for his five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last Congress, President Biden and congressional Democrats delivered with the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. These two laws include major investments that are helping us grow our economy, create millions of clean energy jobs, lower energy prices for Americans, bolster domestic manufacturing, and help us lead the global transition to a clean energy economy. This aggressive action is necessary now. Extreme weather events are becoming more and more frequent with the worsening climate crisis. These events are costing our nation hundreds of billions of dollars every year. They're destroying whole communities, tragically taking lives, homes, and livelihoods. And that's why the investments made by the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law are so important. These laws match the magnitude of the challenge we face and represent the largest investments ever made in America's future. Americans across the country are already beginning to take steps towards using cleaner vehicles and energy sources, but we need to dramatically boost our domestic supply chains and manufacturing capacity in order to meet growing demand. For decades, we have become increasingly dependent on other nations, including China, for both raw materials and the, com the component parts that go into solar panels, wind turbines, electric vehicles, and other energy resources. However, thanks to these two new laws, targeted programs at the Department of Energy and other federal agencies are fostering resilient supply chains and revitalizing domestic manufacturing. Companies have committed hundreds of billions of dollars to clean energy investments and have created more than 142,000 new clean energy jobs. And more commitments are constantly being made. Earlier this month, General Motors announced the second phase of a billion-dollar partnership aimed at rapidly increasing America's battery manufacturing. All of this is going to help us catch up to China, which has spent decades investing to dominate the global clean energy supply chain. As federal agencies continue implementing key programs, we're on track to build on these initial achievements. We can fight the worsening climate crisis and, and deliver economic prosperity for everyone by betting on American ingenuity and work ethic. And that's why I'm pleased we're hearing from DOE's Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains today about how their important work creates jobs and speeds up the clean energy transition. I also look forward to hearing about DOE's robust process for vetting grant applicants and ensuring effective oversight of awardees for the full duration of projects. These investments are going to make a big difference. It's interesting because for years, committee Republicans have voiced concerns that were too reliant on overseas supply chains and manufacturers controlled by China, but they, th but they frankly opposed every democratic effort to bring those jobs and supply chains back to the United States. When we had a hearing on this topic last month, it really sounded like some committee Republicans had given up on trying to challenge China's dominance. But we can't afford to quit. 
And instead of working with us to find bipartisan solutions to big problems, Republicans have spent their time opposing real solutions and then attempting to undermine them at every turn. Before the last hearing, they questioned a potential DOE award to a company called Microvast. Then when DOE conducted due diligence and decided not to move forward with an award to Microvast, Republicans continued to complain about DOE's work. At the end of the day, Republicans seem to have little interest in transitioning to a clean energy economy. Instead, they want to prop up big oil companies. So I'm ready to come together and do the constructive oversight that will help DOE succeed, but I'm not willing to let my Republican colleagues throw in the towel because they would rather put polluters over people. Let's work together to realize the full potential of these laws so that federal investments can deliver lower energy prices, a clean future for our children, clean energy jobs across the country, and a domestic manufacturing base that will be the envy of the world. I think it's very possible if we work together on a bipartisan basis. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. That concludes member opening statements. The chair would like to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members written, op written opening statements will be made a part of the record, but please make sure you provide those to the clerk promptly so that they can be added to the record. We do want to thank our witness for being here today and taking the time to testify before the subcommittee. You will have the opportunity to give an opening statement followed by a round of questions from members. Our witness today is David Howell, Principal Deputy Director of the Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains at the Department of Energy. We appreciate you being here today, and I look forward to hearing from you uh, about what you're working on. As you are aware, that this, the committee is holding an oversight hearing, and when doing so, we have the practice of taking the testimony under oath. Do you have any objection to testifying under oath today? No, sir. Okay. The gentleman does not. Seeing no objection, we'll proceed. The chair also would advise you that you're entitled to be advised by counsel pursuant to House rules. Do you desire to be advised by counsel during your testimony today? All right. Again, he has not requested counsel, so if you would please rise and raise your right hand. Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, sir. Seeing the witness answered in the affirmative, you are now sworn in and under oath and subject to the penalty set forth in Title 18, Section 1001 of the United States Code. With, now, with that, we now recognize Mr. David Howe for five minutes to give an opening statement. Thank you, uh, Chairman Griffith, Ranking Member Castor, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for this opportunity to provide an update on the Department of Energy's efforts to safeguard taxpayer dollars in the implementation of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, also known as the IIJA and the IRA. The IIJA and the IRA are truly historic investments in renewing American infrastructure and supporting American energy security for decades to come. We at the department are working hard to swiftly implement these laws so that we can get these resources out to communities in your districts and in every corner of the country as quickly as possible. We also acknowledge and respect that when Congress appropriated these resources, you entrusted DOE with investments using taxpayer dollars. We take this responsibility incredibly serious. And every day our team of experts and professionals are working tirelessly to ensure that the taxpayer dollars provided to us by Congress are being spent effectively, efficiently, and responsibly. Through the implementation of IIJA and IRA, the Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains, MESC, is striving to install critical supply chain manufacturing capacity, reduce industrial-based carbon emissions, increase clean energy jobs, and provide world-class energy industrial sector analysis. This is, to all, to, this is to ensure that all America is positioned to lead the world in manufacturing the energy technologies of the future. MESC was established in February of 2022 as a new office reporting to the Under Secretary of Infrastructure. MESC aims to support scale up and deployment of the nation's manufacturing capacity through programs that are focused on establishing critical domestic supply chains and increasing circularity while leveraging private sector investment. MESC also works to bolster small and medium enterprises and, and communities in energy transition. MESC catalyzes the development of an energy sector industrial base through investments that establish and secure domestic clean energy supply chains and manufacturing. And by engaging with private sector companies, 
other federal agencies and key stakeholders to collect, analyze, respond to, and share data about energy supply chains to inform future decision making and investment. With funds and authorities provided by the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Defense Production Act, MESC supports $20 billion in programs that further these goals. In addition, MESC is partnering on behalf of DOE with the U.S. Department of Treasury and the Internal Revenue Service to support the Qualifying Advanced Energy Project Credit Program, also known as 48C. We are in the competition phase for a range of programs now, but we have completed selections under the Battery Materials Processing and Battery Manufacturing and Recy Recycling Funding Opportunity. This program represents a tremendous opportunity to reduce our supply chain vulnerability in a critical energy sector. For the battery supply chain, currently virtually all lithium, graphite, battery grade nickel, electrolyte salt, electrode binder, and iron phosphate cathode materials are produced abroad. And China controls the supply chain for many of these inputs. The portfolio of selected projects under the funding opportunity will support developing enough battery grade lithium to supply approximately 2 million EVs annually. In addition, our selectee Solve will build a major battery binder facility in Augusta, Georgia. Our selectee Ascend Elements will build a facility in Kentucky to produce high nickel cathode material from recycled black mass. Our selectee Talon Metals will develop a facility in North Dakota that will produce enough battery grade nickel to supply 400,000 EVs. Our selectees Sila and Group 14 plan to develop commercial scale domestic silicon anode materials production facilities in Washington State. These facilities will supply anode materials for over 600,000 electric vehicle batteries annually. In closing, as the department continues our implementation of IIJA and IRA, we will remain steadfast in our commitment to be responsible stewards of taxpayer dollars and continue taking the proactive steps necessary to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse in our programs while, while we work to bring about a clean and secure energy future that is made in America. On behalf of the department, I appreciate the subcommittee's interest in this topic and the opportunity to provide testimony before you today. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, I thank you for your testimony. We'll now move into the question and answer portion of the hearing, and I will begin the questioning and recognize myself for five minutes. So as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, we sent a letter in December. Uh, Kathy, Chairwoman Kathy Morris Rogers and I then in her ranking uh, position, uh, and I sent the letter to Secretary Granholm requesting a briefing including specific information on the department's efforts to scrutinize microvast. On February 1st, we got a letter back saying that you all were carrying out the review process for the project and the department, quote, would be pleased to provide more information on the status of Microvast and other selectees under the battery materials funding opportunity announcement when the due diligence phase has been completed. Now, at least as far as Microvast was concerned, that due diligence phase was completed on May 22nd. So the question is, when are we going to get the answers to the questions we asked in December, basically dealing with, you know, what is the process, what are you doing, and how do you vet these various uh, companies that are coming in? And, and you can appreciate, I hope, the concern that when you see a company that says in its SEC filing that they're an arm of the Chinese Communist Party, that something wasn't going right then. Later it became right. So I'd like to hear that process, if you would tell us. The process for the vetting of these companies to make sure that they're going to actually be making up things in America for Americans uh, by Americans and with American technology being used here, or at least us having the capability of getting that technology. Thank you for your question, Congressman Griffith. Can you hear me? Is this on? Okay. I can hear you. Go. Oh, good. So um, the vetting process uh, in terms of the BIL awards that you mentioned, in particular Microvast, um, as you know, the selections were made through, through, a, through a competitive solicitation that uh, went through the summer, and part of that vetting process started with that solicitation process where we identified companies that were compelling in terms of selecting them for the negotiation of award. 
once elections are made, that's when detailed negotiations are started. Okay, and in fairness, that most of us did not understand that because it appeared from the press statements that th these people were awardees. But you're telling me that's when the vetting actually began, the, the in-depth vetting began. The in-depth vetting began the day after those announcements. There was also in-depth vetting in terms of the technical capacity and capabilities of the companies before that to, to go to actually make those selections. But those were selections for negotiation of award. And, and what were the reasons then for uh, denying the microvast? Okay. So, so thank you for your concerns about microvast. A company selected for the negotiation of, of an award under the funding opportunity. So microvast is a majority U.S. owned company traded under NASDAQ and, and headquartered in Stafford, Texas with additional locations in Tennessee, Florida, and Colorado. With DOE funding, the company's matching financial investment with the, with the company's matching financial investment, Microvest proposed to build a polyaramid separator material production plant in okay. Clarksville, Tennessee. I got all that, but, but okay. how, do you, how do you square that with their statement to the Securities and Exchange Commission? So that, that the, the, if they were majority U.S. owned, how can the Chinese Communist Party, through its government, the Chinese uh, government, say, why would they say that they could be stopped or changed course because of what the government said in China? So simply because Microvest major production operations are in China. Okay. 90% uh, of their production operations are in China. All right. And, and you vet it. Next question, because and I apologize, we only get five minutes. So <laughs> my next question would then be, and so all of the other companies that you vetted do not have that problem. That is correct. So all the rest of these companies are, if we go in and pick out any one of the ones you named or some others, we're going to find that they don't have these ties to the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese Communist government. They don't have what, sir? The ties. So there was one company that we were concerned with additional to Microvest, as you mentioned. A Amprius. Amprius. And we, after the vetting process, we agreed mutually not to go forward okay. with the award. All right. So the vetting process is working, at least in that regard. It is working very well, and we're actually enhancing that vetting process. And so... It's, uh, I would say it's an enhanced vetting process at this point. And one of, the, one of the things that we've changed is part of the vetting that we do right after the award, like SEC filings, we'll do before award, before selection now. So we'll do more vetting before selection on these awards as we go forward. That was the typical DOE process, that after selection of award, then we go into detailed negotiations, which includes SEC filing, a look at the SEC filings of the company, and so we will actually be doing that before selection of award from now on. Yeah. I didn't, as my Democrat colleagues are so apt to point out, I did not uh, agree with the, the way things were done and, and some of the focus of the bill, so I didn't vote for it. But now that we're here, I want to make sure the American taxpayer dollars are spent correctly, and I appreciate your testimony here today, and I yield back. Yeah. Now recognize the gentlewoman. From Florida, Ms. Castor, the ranking member of the subcommittee. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that's that's our, our intent too to make sure that the, the Department of Energy has the tools it needs to to vet these projects. You have an enormous responsibility. I mean, already the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the the infrastructure law, have created kind of this new domestic manufacturing boom. Uh, it's hard to keep up with the announcements that come so quickly on battery plants, recycling opportunities, electric cars and trucks. Um, how, what, what have you put in place now to really monitor? You said this is enhanced vetting. Maybe go into a little more detail. We've learned some lessons from uh, the Recovery Act of a decade ago. What has changed in that's bringing enhanced vetting and processes, and do you have all the tools you need to, to get the job done? So thank you, Congresswoman, for that question. Um, and so in terms of what's changed in the vetting process, um, we are actually have developed a research technology and economic security team at the department. Right, hang on a second. We, we have stopped the time. Our technical people tell us you need to move the microphone a little bit closer so that they can pick it up for C-SPAN. We good? could hear you fine. Can you hear me now? And point it up. Yep. Point it up. Yeah. How's this? That's better. much better. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. So we, we, and we didn't take that time away from you. So if you want to start that question, 
I think he, he's going to gonna get into enhanced vetting. Okay, enhanced go ahead. Vetting. So our enhanced vetting pr process actually cuts across all of the Department of Energy. It's not that we were not doing vetting in, in, in the past, but because of the language, particularly in the, in the bipartisan infrastructural law that included language on priority given to non-foreign entities of concern, that was actually the first time that the Department of Energy actually received that type of language in an appropriation. So MESC received that and or and are, are sort of the, the ones that are actually out okay, there. Okay, let me follow up on that because Microvast is a U.S. company. As, uh, the, the owner is a U.S. citizen, as far as I know, information that, that's been provided. They uh, want to move business out of China and, and build more jobs and factories in the U.S. I'm sure there are a lot of American companies that are doing business in China that are not arms of the, the Chinese Communist Party. How are you, how, how are you analyzing? Because we want, we want these jobs to be American jobs. We want to build our supply chains. And we don't, but I'm sure that there are in, uh, quite a number of companies that do business in China that may not be attached to the Chinese government. That, and that is correct. So we, we took the time to determine uh, the appropriate uh, metrics uh, to, uh, to use in order to determine what the influence is from the Chinese Communist Party particularly. And um, that would include you know, in, intellectual property positions uh, for that company and the, and the particular technology that is being pursued. It also includes ownership of the company, um, not only investment ownership, ownership by, the, uh, by the government itself, um, ownership by other Chinese entities, including investment companies and individuals, and also um, and, and the percent of ownership and, and key suppliers as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, key personnel, uh, those that are on their board of directors, those that are voting members of their board of directors. And again, lastly, though, any um, concerns with the talents programs uh, that, uh, that, that may provide concerns for us. So after you go through the, this enhanced vetting with the, all of those metrics, do companies get uh, some transparency? Do, do you respond and tell them, well, you were, uh, you were not awarded because you, you hit these markers? So the, the department reserves the right to back out of negotiations mm -hmm. without explanation. Mm -hmm. And the companies understand that as they go in That's, for those applications? That is written into the funding opportunity announcement. And it's also given to the company as well. They're, they are actually entitled to back out of the negotiations at any time for, for no reason. Okay. Oversight uh, and investigations is going to be very important because of the significant responsibilities and resources to the Department of Energy. We heard from the uh, Department of Energy Inspector General on how they, she and her office, very constrained. So I was very concerned. Um, to see what was coming out of the Appropriations Committee for the Department of Energy Inspector General. Uh, it's $92 million below the President's request. And I would hope this is an area where we could work together. Uh, we know that those monies invested often save taxpayers money. Department of Energy has been, uh, IG has been um, funded at a lower level than other agencies. Does that hamstring what you need to do on oversight, uh, Dr. Howe? So we have actually worked hand in hand with the Office of Inspector General early in this process to make sure that all of the oversight levers that we have already established throughout the federal government through DOE on these types of awards are in place and are strong and, and that we have a plan in implementing uh, um, the programs uh, whether it's uh, detection, whether it's mitigation um, of, of any issues. We're always um, appreciative and collaborative with the Office of Inspector General, um, but we have worked with them to make sure that um, not only the MESC has the resources in place as we go forward with these awards, not only to select these awards and negotiate them, but actually to execute them and oversee them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. Yields back, and now recognize the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Department of Energy's budget has ballooned to a size that we just simply have never seen before. 
since 2021, the department has injected with hundreds of billions in new funds and loan authority. 62 billion through the IIJA, 67 billion through the CHIPS Act, 35 billion through the IRA, and 1 billion through the 2023 omnibus. To understand what this means, you only have to see how the budget has increased since fiscal year 2022 when it was 44 billion. Combined, the IIJA, the IRA, CHIPS Act, and Omnibus have authorized or appropriated nearly 130 billion to the Department of Energy, which to be honest, has stumbled through program implementation and engaged in negotiations with at least one company with questionable foreign ties. I have serious questions about staffing, capacity, and over ma overall management uh, of the budget. Deputy Director Howell, the Office of Manage Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains has been entrusted with operating several new programs and administering more than $15 billion. Uh, how many staff does your office currently have? We have almost five dozen staff on board um, as of this week. We also have memorandums of agreement with our procurement and acquisition team at the National Energy Technology Laboratory and our procurement and acquisition team at the Golden Field Office. We've also established a memorandum of agreement with the Department of Trans Treasury. Do you know the rough breakdown between federal employees and contractors? All, all six dozen, or five dozen for MESC are all federal contractors. Okay. In your testimony. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Are federal, all federal employees. employees. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we both knew the answer. Uh, in your testimony, you state your office has been focused on hiring sufficient staff, including program oversight specialists, grant management and contracting specialists, and financial audit oversight staff. What percentage of your staff are dedicated to vetting applications under financial award programs for issues such as problematic foreign ties of applicants? So um, we have teams of staff for each funding opportunity, and um, the, the percentage of our staff is probably about 70% to 75% that are dedicated to the procurement, uh, for the funding opportunity, technical evaluation, selection, and then we use the, uh, the National Energy Technology Laboratory um, procurement and acquisition team. That's roughly um, around 20 FTEs that we use across the procurement and legal system and contracting system at the NETL Morgantown and, um, and smaller effort at the Golden Field, Golden Field Office. So we have a, a large contingent. Some of our activities actually depend on other offices, by the way, general counsel, our um, committee on foreign in, uh, committee on foreign investment in U.S. A counterintelligence uh, team. Um, um, I'm and, meeting and with CFIUS at on Thursday morning, CFIUS, tomorrow morning. Yes. So. so we do we do actually tap into other um, teams within the Department of Energy. Uh, are you at full staff? No, we are not. Uh, what additional staff do you need to reach those levels? So our target is to get to 88 employees um, this calendar year to implement both the BIL and the IRA provisions. And you're trying to get there by the end of? By the end of this calendar year. Okay. Can you provide an approximate percentage of what staff are new to DOE versus those moving from other programs? Uh, from, that's not a really fair from, question. So that's, I can get back to you on that. I don't have that number, but it's, it's from within the Department of Energy, we do have a, a fairly large contingent of, of um, folks, uh, key, key program management people who have joined MESC, but we've also tapped into outside resources that are outside the federal government as well, and then some resources that are in other agencies. Uh, on February 21st, 2023, uh, Ranking Member Barrasso of the Senate Energy and Natural Resource Committee wrote to the Deputy Secretary Turk expressing concern that DOE's October 19th, 2022 statements regarding selections under the funding uh, opportunities were misleading. Are you aware of that? I am aware of that. Um, the Senate letter noted that October statement made references to projects that suggested awards were final, and of the 20 companies selected for the award, share prices of those companies that were publicly traded increased an average of about 14% between the day before and the day of the department's announcement. There are real-world market implications that accompany the awards process, which appear to be at best mismanaged, at worst mis misleading. Uh, does your office plan to make any changes to its applicant vetting process or procedure for announcing selections considering these notification concerns? 
We will emphasize that any selections are the selections for negotiation of award. Now, we do have feedback in any one uh, funding opportunity with the Department of Energy, particularly one of the size. You could get hundreds of applications, and our private sector investors actually would rather us to, to announce the selections so that they can free up their own resources that were tied to applications. I didn't, I'd like the announcement, too, if my stock was going to go up 14%. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of those that were not, that were not selected. Um, because they have actually committed funds to their application and committed resources in case that they're um, selected to negotiate. It's also a signal to those that are selected to um, that we're going to go into deep um, negotiations, and so they need to set aside their resources in order to meet the need for that negotiation and also to, to um, uh, uh, provide the foundation for their cost share because their cost share is really what drives the award. Thanks. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Now recognize Ms. Schakowsky for her five minutes of questioning. So thanks to the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, we've already seen 142,000 new jobs that have been created. And it is uh, estimated that between the IRA and the Chips and Science Act that by 2030, we should see nearly half a million new jobs, which is what we need in this country. Um, and yet we see from the Republicans that uh, they, they want to reverse the progress that we've seen and uh, cut these, uh, the, these programs. Um, which I think is, uh, is a serious mistake. But I have to tell you that I have been surprised in the discussions about this. The pessimism about the ability of us to have the kind of innovation that we need to uh, create the jobs and help our, our economy. And so what I um, am concerned about is that um, you know we um, will not be able to achieve it if we have those kinds of reductions. So I wanted to uh, I wanted to ask you, um, Acting uh, Director Howell, um, what uh, I want to I wanted to ask ask you about the creation of jobs that uh, that we need and to uh, hopefully set the record straight on our ability to, to reach that. And so is your office helping to bring back jobs that have been sent overseas in the past um, for, for decades? Thank you, Congresswoman. And that's such an important question uh, because that's uh, really what this is all about, not only now but in, in the future. These are future technologies that we're investing in. And uh, we have to do that as a nation in order to secure American jobs in the future. So in terms of American innovation, innovation is what has gotten us here at this point with the battery program. And that's a longstanding research and development support from Congress for, for many decades. Many of the key technologies that have been developed in the battery program that has actually launched this revolution were developed with federal, U.S. federal funds. Uh, through the Department of Energy, whether it's new cathode materials, new anode materials, new, new battery technologies. So we see that. We've done that very well, and we'll continue to do that to go to the next generation that it will even drive down costs, improve performance, and, and improve um, our competitiveness. There's no reason why our U.S. industry cannot stand up and actually compete on a world market here. We can do this, whether it's in minerals, whether it's in refined materials, whether it's in battery production or recycling. So this is, this is a bright spot. And so we should, we should really be, number one, applaud the work that we've done already to get to this spot, but also take on the challenges that we need in order to make sure that we're successful in the future. One of the things that I have the privilege of being is the chair of the Federal Consortium for Advanced Batteries. It's, um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a federal consortium of about 17 different federal agencies, about 60 different offices within those federal agencies that have band together <clears throat> to, um, to collaborate, to coordinate, and to help each other to make sure that we are supporting this robust, this resilient domestic battery supply chain. Let me ask you a question about um, developing the workforce that, that we need and is anything that 
MESC is doing to make sure after we have all these um, innovations that we have the workforce to do the job. Right. Understand that, that building a strong supply chain for the United States is more about people than it is about product. So, for example, uh, in, in the Manufacturing Energy Supply Chains Office, part of one of our programs is the Industrial Assessment Centers, which is um, used to actually uh, to, to um, assess ways in which small and medium-sized enterprises across the country can improve their productivity, can reduce emissions, can reduce um, um, energy use. Um, at 37 universities across the nation, we're using their engineering students to go out and actually provide these assessments. We've also supporting uh, pilot centers, manufacturing centers for battery manufacturing uh, that, will, um, that we're building uh, across the, across the um, uh, nation as well. The federal consortium that I mentioned, um, which, you know, which DOE is, is, is a member uh, across the Department of Energy, MESC is the anchor tenant, has a workforce task, task force for batteries as well. So we're working with folks like the Department of Labor, Department of Commerce, Department of Defense as well to, to stand up um, uh, the manufacturing workforce. We also have uh, launched a... a, a my, my time is actually... Um, uh, Expired. Go ahead. Finish this something. I'll if finish that's this all right. Mr. <laughs> Launched a private partner, private sector partnership called Libridge, that is also part of that. Um, that includes about um, 300 different industry members. That is focused on workforce development as well. So we're working hand in hand with industry on this. Well, thank you for your work <laughs> and for your presentation. And I yield back. Thank the gentlelady for yielding back. Now recognize the gentleman from Kentucky. <laughs> Mr. Thank Guthrie you. for his five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you for the recognition. Thank you for being here. Uh, you know, the concern isn't on, on our side, at least not at, for me, that American companies won't be innovative and create the technology that's going to move us forward. My concern is that corporate America is just investing for the subsidies right now. And if we didn't get the subsidy, if the, if the people in Congress didn't get the subsidies right, we're going to, our supply chain is going to be completely is going to be off kilter over the next decade or so because we've demanded by EPA that two-thirds of all cars will be electric within 10 years. It takes five to seven years to create a new car. So that's where all the investment's going. So let's go a few years down the road. We can't do two-thirds. We can't do 10, 10 That's 10 million cars. And, and so what the issue is is that we just completely dismiss. Every time we bring up any issues, they just get completely dismissed. We're going to enter way out of it. You're subsidizing one side of it, not the other, and, and quite honestly, putting in roadblocks for what's the most important thing is generation, generating power. We've had, we have blackouts in Kentucky, and we have blackouts in Kentucky. TVA had a myriad of reasons, and one said they didn't realize so many people were using heat pumps. So now we have all these heat pumps that de demand more electricity, which is, is, it, is how it should be. However, you got to build the electricity to support them. And then in the IRA, or the Jobs Act, I can't remember which one, subsidizes heat pumps. So we're going to have more of those. Um, we're also mandating electric cars. So we're going to have more of those. But it seems like the administration is mandating all of that. But any effort to try to generate more uh, reliable, uh, sustainable, and dispatchable electricity just doesn't seem to be moving forward. Does that seem to be very incongruent, that we're going to have more demand... Batteries don't produce electricity. Batteries don't generate it. Batteries store it. Does that not seem incongruent to you, the policies of this administration of demanding more electric but not uh, wanting to produce it? Thank you, Congressman, for your concern. Um, I'm going to put my hat on as former director of the Vehicle Technologies Office, uh, where we had um, a partnership with U.S. industry, both the automotive sector, the fuel sector, and the electric utility sector. Mm -hmm. They were all on board with electrification, particularly from the electric um, utility perspective. It well, they want to sell it. They just want to be able to generate it. Well, they actually have plans. Many of them. Look, we actually did a, um, a study on scale-up um, mm -hmm. EVs. At, we called it EVs at scale to, to uh, look at the pro progress of the market entry of electric vehicles and what needs to be done on the electric side to make sure that the, the electric utility is capable of supplying the, the, the load. And so we can support 10 million cars a year being produced in, given time, in nine years? Yes, given time. There's been times in... in well, in nine years. That's what the rule is. Given, given time. Now, this, this report was before 2020, so it was 10 years at the time. Mm -hmm. So given time... Well, the rule just came out. The... 
given, to, well, this was actually working on uh, scenarios with the utilities mm -hmm. and um, in terms of EV penetration scenarios and, and what the utility needs would be for those. So well, we've had a lot of them come to our office and they're concerned about the ability. I mean, it's not just dismissible. It is not. And, and you know, you can build, I think it's, somebody told me 70, I've heard 90 plug-in hybrid, uh, plug-in hybrid but electric, electric vehicles for plug-in hybrid than you can for a one solid electric vehicle. And, and you also have, don't have a problem with range if you have plug-in hybrids, you have lower carbon. You don't have zero carbon, you have lower carbon. And it just seems like we're incentivizing technology. That's why we're not being innovative because, and let me tell you, when you sit a bunch of companies down and say, here's a bunch of federal subsidies if you want to do what we ask you to do, they don't say no. They don't turn down money. They don't turn down money. Let me get to the other, but we also know a lot of the technology is coming from the Communist, technology, the Communist Party. So a lot of the, how do we ensure, what process do you have in place to make sure that the Chinese Communist Party does not benefit from Jobs Act money or IRA money? So we do have the, the new vetting process, particularly that looked specifically at Chinese ownership of companies. But also, we, um, a part of that RTES program is to provide in what we call enhanced protections for IP. Uh -huh. And so we actually put that into all the awards, those mm -hmm. enhanced protections. And we also, um, in these awards, we added uh, the requirement to have a cybersecurity plan for each. I only have about 30 seconds, so let me just get to this point. I'm sorry. But in your, in your testimony, you say, should DOE's oversight mechanisms uncover direct or in support of the Chinese Communist Party? So you say it's possible. So you're saying in your testimony, should you uncover it, you will take appropriate action. What's appropriate action? Well, Is it zero? Zero, zero American dollars going to the Chinese Communist Party supported enterprises? Yes. Zero. And that's the case now? For, for, the, for dollars going to the Chinese Communist Party. To, to, well, every business in China is related to the Chinese Communist You can't separate the two. If you do, you don't understand China. But, however, you can look at a U.S. company and determine what the percentage of Chinese ownership is and what control. So the answer is not zero, it Chinese may, ownership. It, Chinese influence or control? O owner, any ownership in a, or, or, can, or there, any joint venture with a Chinese-owned company is, is not zero? There can get subsidies under these job acts? If they're not, if they do not control the entity. So that um, draws back into percentage of ownership. So some percentage can go to the Chinese owner owned. Some businesses. percentage would go to a U.S. company that may have a percentage of Chinese ownership. Okay. Thank you. For so that. it's going to a, to a U.S. Just want to emphasize it would be going to a U.S. company. Mm -hmm. Some of the U.S. companies are actually publicly traded. And they're pairing with China. Yep. So they can get back. the money. Yep. Thank you. Nuances. Yep. Nuances. Gentlemen, yields back now. Recognize Dr. Ruiz of California for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In my district sits Lithium Valley, one of the largest lithium sources in the world. You guys are going to hear a lot about Lithium Valley. The United States Geological Survey projects that the Salton Sea area alone could produce 600,000 metric tons of lithium annually, which is six times the current global consumption rate. That has the potential to supply 40% of the global lithium demand. Companies in Imperial Valley, in which the Lithium Valley resides, will have the opportunity to extract lithium manufacture and assemble batteries because of the Inflation Reduction Act. The Inflation Reduction Act makes the single largest, largest investment ever in combating climate change while bringing clean energy manufacturing jobs to local communities. Since its enactment, companies have announced over $242 billion in new clean energy capital investments. Additionally, this law has already created over 3,300 jobs and invested $5.45 billion in clean energy projects in California alone. In fact, the IRA has given companies like State Volt in Imperial the opportunity to purchase land for Gigafactory, which will be used for 54 gigawatt hours lithium ion battery production. This will become one of the largest gigafactories in North America and will produce enough batteries to power 650,000 electric vehicles per year. Additionally, companies like Berkshire Hathaway and General Motors are investing in projects in Lithium Valley, and this is just the start of a public-private relationship that both Democrats and Republicans have been striving for. 
Lithium Valley will become the hub for domestic battery market manufacturing that will revitalize the region and our country, and these investments will help communities that have been left behind for generations, or at least that's the intent, and we will fight to ensure that that happens. Because as we move toward a clean energy economy, it is important to ensure that supply chain investments strengthen local communities by creating good paying jobs and taking steps to minimize the environmental impacts of these industries. So Mr. Howe, how might DOE investments in clean energy projects benefit local communities, especially those that have been left behind in the past? Thank you for your Congressman, and uh, for, thank you Congressman for your question. And it's so important, and I'll start with Lithium Valley. I had the privilege of taking a team, of a federal team, to Lithium Valley in April. We had over 15 people from the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense to actually tour the area and to get firsthand not only knowledge of the of the source there and the and the uh, potential for that source, but also we reached out into the community to talk to the community on how the Department of Energy can actually help those communities that have been left behind. So that's so, so important. I uh, look forward to working with you and the California in Energy Commission who hosted us on this visit um, in the future to make sure that we're providing the support we need to tap into that that really, really important resource for us. Lithium is a future energy. All too frequently, communities of color and low-income families shoulder the burden of pollution and environmental hazards. Uh, moving to cleaner energy sources will lower emissions, uh, which will lower emissions is a step in the right direction, but we need to make sure that our investments building up clean energy and critical mineral supply chains that are not inflicting new harms on communities already impacted by past pollutions especially in terms of battery uh, and the recycling of batteries. So as we work to stand up these new industries nationwide, what steps is MESC taking uh, to ensure federally funded projects minimize negative environmental and health impacts? So and part of our selection criteria is a reduction in those, uh, and part of the impact evaluation is how much reduction in uh, negative impacts could that particular project actually achieve, whether that's greenhouse gas emissions, criteria emissions, water use, uh, energy use. We also have part of a, a, a sort of a, a unique activity within these um, um, awards to actually reach out to the communities. We call it the Community Benefits Plan to discuss how these awards can actually increase jobs in the area, training, and, and address community concerns and issues that that specific community may have with that award. Okay, so I um, look forward to meeting with you uh, separate from this hearing to discuss the opportunities yes, specifically sir. for the economic and well-being of the local residents uh, with this incredible opportunity, not just for our country, the state, but also specifically for those communities that have, for too long have been the most under-resourced, the most underserved in the state of California. I look forward to it. Thank Congress. you. Gentlemen, you'll back now recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Duncan, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not going to hold my breath until California allows lithium mining to happen in that state and the EPA allows it with their uh, threat on mining across the country. And without baseload generation, you're not going to have the energy produced to make all the EVs work, so we need baseload generation. And then you also need copper mining um, for the, the motors. You have to wind copper around and make motors uh, that go in the EVs. So you know, why is there a threat on uh, an, an assault on mining in this country? It's just baffling that we're talking about mining here. Uh, Mr. Howell, will you commit to answering the questions raised in our December 14th letter regarding uh, DOE's grant awarded microvast? Would you ask that question again? Sir? Will you commit to answering the questions that we raised okay. in this December 14th letter to you or to Secretary Granholm so about microvast? Thank you. I will, I will take that back to the Department of Energy. That's actually handled by another office. I'm actually not. Uh, so you're just committing to taking that question okay. that I just asked you back? not committing to answering the questions. Um, the Department of Energy is in the process of answering those questions. Since December 14th? Wow. They, you know, it's over six months. Um, you know, the rest of greens resulted in new efficiency standards with marginal uh, efficacy, and, and that will increase our reliance on foreign manufacturers. We, we heard from uh, others already about critical components. 
um, from distribution transformers to capacitors to, uh, for HVDC transmission lines, new efficiency standards have required different manufacturing processes we have and limited supply domestically. I guess the Lithium Valley will solve all that. Unfortunately, instead of utilizing the few manufacturers we have here at home, we see contracts go abroad. I heard uh, the, the ranking member of the full committee talk about Republicans. Republicans wanted to onshore industry. We were called fascists and nationalists wanting to make America great again, wanting to bring manufacturing back to this country, provide jobs and the critical components that we need to make it all work. So does MESC provide any advice or coordination with other department programs, such as the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, to advise on how proposed efficiency standards will impact domestic supply chains? We, we do have partnerships with, across the Department of Energy uh, in terms of actually advising EE or EE. It would be in the manufacturing capacity uh, of our expertise rather than the efficiency capacity uh, expertise. So in terms of manufacturing of transformers and high voltage DC components and things of that nature, that's where our expertise would lie. Shouldn't those be made here in the United States? Absolutely. Right now we're relying on Italy and Germany. We have for the first phase of transmission line infrastructure build out, it's a, a, a European com company that is sourcing capacitors from Siemens and a company in Italy. Shouldn't those be made here? These are critical, right? Yes, sir. 60,000 needed and, and for we, the infrastructure. And we um, ask your support to help MESC to actually uh, develop programs. There's a company in South Carolina that actually can make the capacitors. But yeah, they're competing with a European company because the company that got awarded the contract is from Europe. What if Europe decides they're going to build out their infrastructure and, hey, they need all the capacitors? Then we don't have a supply chain here. 60,000 that are needed. I'm not aware of the specific award you're well, talking about. It, in your testimony, you mentioned the department is standing up a $65 million program, battery and critical material recycling retailers as collection points and state and local programs. Who do you think should be responsible for the disposal of EV batteries at the end of their life? Well, it could cut across uh, the owner of the vehicle and the actual... Uh, so we're putting the burden on the owner to know where to dispose these? Or to dispose them themselves? Typically, vehicles already disposed of, salvaged. And so we would see that we would be working with those salvaged dealers and, uh, and companies and associations to, to actually collect the vehicles like they do today and uh, safely transport key components like the battery to a recycling center. See, I see these shade tree mechanics having to dispose of them, not knowing where to put them, and take them to their local landfill. They're actually, well, they would not uh, be compatible with the local landfill. And however, they're also actually valuable and worth money. So I don't think, uh, I would hope that a, a, a well, local. That's assuming you have recyclers out there that will actually pay somebody for them. Um, should the taxpayer bear the cost of recycling the EV batteries? EV batteries right now are actually profitable to recycle because of the cobalt and the nickel and the lithium. I know of one company that is doing it. There are several companies actually doing it. All right. I'd love to know who they okay. are. Has MSC consulted states and localities or received any feedback about the potential role in the recycling process? Oh, we have. And we've worked with the uh, Environmental Protection Agency as well and their um, consumer electronics programs. Uh, so we're, we're working with uh, EPA. We're working with uh, um, the uh, NHTSA and, uh, and the uh, Pipeline Hazardous Materials uh, agency to make sure that we put in process the the capability to safely um, collect batteries, to store them, and to transport them to a recycling center. Uh, Lord, I hope so, because, uh, you know, these are highly toxic. And I know of a case, I'm glad the, over, the uh, Environment Committee is having a brownfield hearing this week, because I know of one instance where a, a transformer was thrown into a landfill in New Jersey. And the company that manufactured it on behalf of the DOD, because they were required to during World War II, ended up having to pay millions of dollars in fines. They didn't throw it in the landfill. They were just the manufacturer. Somebody did. If the consumer throws a lithium battery in the landfill, who's responsible for the cleanup? Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding up in, in, in those regards. In my neck of the woods, if there isn't a positive value, it's going in, into the next holler over. With that, I yield to the gentlelady from uh, Colorado, Ms. get for her five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, so we all agree on this committee in a bipartisan way that lithium and cobalt, 
cobalt are going to be essential for the clean energy transition. And as we heard from Mr. Ruiz, um, we, you know, we do have reserves of some of these minerals, uh, and, um, but many of the largest deposits of these minerals are in other countries. And that's not our fault. That's Mother Nature and ha just the nature of geography. So we can't control where the minerals naturally occur, but what we can do is we can do something about where we're refining the minerals. So that's what I wanted to ask you about, Mr. Howell, because this is one thing. China has invested very heavily in critical mineral refining. Refining, they capture about 90% of the rare earth element processing and 70% of the lithium and cobalt processing. And I know the department knows this because last Congress, the Democrats invested more than $6 billion to build domestic critical mineral processing and recycling through programs administered by the Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains. So here's my question. I've got a couple questions. Number one, will these investments help us compete with China on critical mineral processing and build up domestic processing capability, irrespective of where the deposits are? Uh, thank you, Cong Congresswoman. And to answer your question, point blank is yes. That's exactly what our mission is. That's exactly what we're trying to actually execute. We've come a long way even with these um, first awards uh, with lithium and nickel, and but we have a long way to go. Okay, so my my other question is, you got you now Congress has allocated six billion dollars for this. Is that going to help speed up the time frame to be able to? Uh, process this because that's what we need to do and pronto. It, it will help speed up. Uh, for example, um, the selections for award, uh, we selected 2.8 billion of the 6 billion for negotiation of award. The private sector actually um, invested an additional $6 billion in those awards. So that was a $9 billion effort to um, stand up refining capability. And how fast are we going to start be able to start standing it up, would so you we're, estimate? We, we're, we've made three awards already. Okay, uh, how long is it going to take them to start doing it? Typically, these factories take around 36 to 42 months. To okay, so, so maybe three, three and a half, four years. And how much was that expedited by the investment that we made? Uh, by three or four years. It okay, <laughs> so maybe, maybe it was cut in half the amount of time it would take. Yes. That's excellent. Why would you say it's important to invest in both critical mineral processing and recycling, particularly in the battery supply chain? The, the minerals and materials and the refined materials that are contained in the batteries represent about 50 to 60 percent of the value. And when you're talking about of an electric vehicle battery, and you're talking about a potential market of 100 to 200 billion dollars, we can't just walk away from half of that because we do not install the refining capability and the precursor capability. You're, you're exactly right. Seems like a good investment for us. Um, so we keep hearing from our friends on the other side of the aisle about DOE's ability to oversee federal investments. Now, the, the job of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee is to make sure that we are, that these investments are being overseen. So you've been at DOE for at least a couple of decades. So I want you to uh, talk about this for the record. Does DOE take seriously its obligation to responsibly use taxpayer money? And what kinds of protocols does DOE have in place to make sure that you are doing that? Um, absolutely. The Department of Energy takes extreme serious the, um, the, our, our role of, of overseeing the, the um, execution of taxpayer dollars. And we do work um, with the um, agent, uh, with, with offices throughout the agency to ensure that we have um, the right oversight um, on these projects, including the Office of Inspector General, um, our procurement offices, our acquisition offices, and of course our technology, our technical program managers as well. Um, typically once we have an award in place, uh, we have a, a working team that will actually monitor and shepherd that, that program through, through its life cycle all the way through the end of the award to even the disposition of equipment. Um, 
and we use um, many different processes um, um, to, to monitor the award. The first thing is to, defini to definitize the actual project, to make sure that we have the right milestones, budget periods, and tasks in place as we launch. Okay, I'm out of time. <laughs> if there's more you want to say, you can supplement. Thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlelady. She yields back. Now recognize the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what components for an ion, uh, lithium, uh, lithium ion batteries are made in the United States? You what, what components? Yeah, what components of, of your, say, an EV battery? So almost in made, some... Made, not, not assembled. No, made. I'm almost... Okay, so the battery... Let's start with the battery cell technology, the battery cell production. In 2020, the, the um, United States had 60 gigawatt hours of capacity installed. No, no. What, let, let's simplify this okay. because there, there are people watching this and, and we need to simplify it. You have technical expertise. I worked in engineering, so I, I don't want to get down in those weeds. Let's say 90-something percent of all of the, of, the, of the battery is manufactured in China, the component parts. So when you're talking about battery production in the United States, what you're really talking about is assembly of the components manufactured in China. Not Isn't totally. Well, I so, didn't say totally. I said 90-something percent. In, in some areas, it is 90 percent. In some areas, it's less than that. Okay. Right. But the vast majority of batteries that are being assembled in the United States, the component parts are manufactured in China. And, and back to, I, I think my, my colleagues across the aisle have raised some interesting points about the minerals that are required. Uh, obviously, we have huge reserves of lithium, but we just uh, took off, made off limits the largest cobalt reserve in the entire country in Minnesota. It's also a, a major reserve of nickel. You have to have cobalt, you have to have nickel. And 78% uh, of the cobalt uh, is sourced in China uh, that, that you have to have for this. 100% uh, of the graphite and we've got graphite reserves here in the United States, and and with all due respect to, to my friend from California, uh, there's substantial lithium reserves in, in Arkansas. But the problem is, to utilize those reserves, we have to mine them, we have to refine them, and we have to manufacture the whatever the component parts are that we need from those minerals, and we're not doing that. We're dependent on China. Do you disagree with that? So we're dependent on China today on many of the aspects of materials and refined materials? It will be 25 years minimum before we can catch up with China. That's how far ahead of, of, of us they are in battery production. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that's debatable. Well, it's debatable only because you, it yeah. doesn't fit your narrative. No, that's not true. Um, for instance, these awards that we just awarded, um, we, we awarded enough... Um, uh, capacity Let me to suggest to you that if you had all of the components, all, everything you needed in minerals right now, you might be correct, but you can't even get a mine permitted in, in the next decade under the under current conditions. So I just think people need to understand how far behind we are and how dependent we are on China. There's another issue that I want to raise in, in the time I have left, and, and it has to do with... Um, Battery technology that was uh, was described as breakthrough technology. There are about a dozen scientists in the state of Washington. It's um, a Vandium Redux flow battery. And um, I don't know what you know about this, but uh, this was this would have been a battery about the size of a refrigerator. It would have, I think, uh, powered a whole household. Uh, it could have been recharged with a solar panel. I mean, this was truly breakthrough stuff. And in 2021, the Department of Energy gave the license to China. Uh, um, there, uh, I think uh, NPR was trying to do an investigative report on this. The DOE has not been forthcoming with information. What do you have to say about that? What do you know about that? So I am familiar with the vanadium reflo uh, re redox flow battery mm -hmm. for stationary applications, for good applications. Um, there was um, some uh, IP developed at the Department of Energy specific Northwest National Laboratory that eventually was licensed to a Chinese company. But that's money, that, that 
uh, work was funded with U.S. taxpayer dollars. Yes, it was. And you gave the license to China. Mr. Chairman, I think this is something we need to look into a little bit further. So with that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Appreciate the gentleman yielding back. Now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I, I said in my opening, and I'm, you know, just based on what I heard, and I'm not trying to be, um, you know, disrespectful, but it just seems like, you know, on the Republican side, there's this notion that we're so far behind China, it's almost like there's nothing we can do to catch up. And um, maybe there's no use even trying. I don't want to put words in my colleagues' mouths, but, you know, I'm just worried that... Um, these you're getting these mixed partisan signals, you know, on the one hand, Democrats are saying, let's make investments, let's try to do things that will make a difference here in terms of competition with China. And then, you know, colleagues on the other side suggesting maybe it's hopeless. I mean, doesn't that, um, doesn't the, don't these mixed signals, you know, about long term funding for these DOE programs uh, have a, a, a negative impact on companies willingness to make uh, investments in the United States? If you could just briefly answer that, and then I'll get to my second, the real questions I have. I, I will say that uh, long-term uh, disciplined investment strategy for the United States, both on the federal level and the private sector, is going to be very important going forward. And mixed signals can cause confusion in the, in, in, in the industry. And also, um, can, can cause a lot of stop, start stops uh, with, with the federal programs. All right. Now, before our last hearing on this topic, Republicans spent months questioning a potential DOE award to Microvast. It was mentioned again today. And then when press reports indicated that DOE would not move forward with an award to Microvast after conducting due diligence, Republicans still looked to undermine DOE. So you're, I, I just think you're in essentially in a no-win situation here with what the Republicans are doing to you today and elsewhere. Um, and, and ultimately, it's going to undermine any actions or in, uh, investments that you make. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity to walk through the process of selecting companies for negotiation and your due diligence process. For, let me ask two questions. From the time that a company applies for an award for one of their programs in your office, what due diligence does DOE conduct, and what other agencies do you partner with in that process? So from the time that the selection is made for negotiation, so um, even before that time, we have, uh, we have worked with other agencies to evaluate uh, these, these applications and selected the most compelling applications, uh, whether it's technical merit, whether it's market, uh, market potential, um, investment, um, and, and, and resources that the company has, has proposed. Once those selections are made, we deep dive into the negotiation process to really definitize those awards. So we do work, in this case, it typically falls on our procurement and acquisition team, our technical leaders at the Department of Energy to, to move through that process. We do use um, uh, um, other teams like the general counsel, like the counterintelligence, like the CFIUS team, um, to look at any sensitivities for that particular company or company team, and then uh, develop potential, whether um, those sensitivities warrant um, us walking away from that award, or, or providing mitigation strategies to overcome barriers or gaps or concerns that we might have. So what kinds of concerns would keep DOE from actually providing a company an award? Maybe you've well, answered that, but... If you... Sure. So um, ownership by a federal entity of concern, as defined in the, in the, in the regulations and, and, and the appropriation, um, the control that, that a federal entity of concern could actually exhibit over um, a, comp a U.S. company, that control could be shares um, in the company. It could be the parent company um, um, ownership as well. And, and it could also be, um, as I mentioned, uh, voting members on the board. Um, it could be um, key personnel uh, being part of a th uh, talents program. Um, could be an IP position. Um, okay. All that. Well, look, let me just thank you, Mr. Howell. Uh, thank you for the work that DOE has taken on in making these programs a success and ensuring that taxpayer dollars are well spent. So I just hope 
again, that Republicans will join uh, us in helping DOE, DOE succeed, because I do think this is important. I don't think it's too late, and I think we have to do whatever we can to, to move you know, our country forward and be competitive with China. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back now. Recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our ranking member for co-hosting this hearing, and thank you to our witness, uh, uh, Deputy Director Howell. Thank you for sharing your very informed voice and uh, experience and grounding us in facts. I appreciate that. Our clean energy transition needs to move quickly to prevent the worst consequences of climate change. We also must move quickly to experience the economic benefits of being the global leader in this transition. The U.S. has already missed out on some earlier opportunities to invest in clean energy while other countries like China invested aggressively to give their industries a lead. But now we have that opportunity to reverse that trend. Major investments made by uh, legislation like the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law are helping bring manufacturing jobs back to the U.S. and build those supply chains. My Republican colleagues often call for ending our reliance on global supply chains, in part to protect human rights, but they have opposed these major legislative efforts that would help us build ethical and resilient supply chains right here in the U.S. So, Deputy Director Howell, the MESC is overseeing billions of dollars in investments to build domestic clean energy supply chains and manufacturing. I hope your testimony helps everyone better uh, understand how effectively these investments will advance American interests, including by protecting human rights. So how will the investments made through the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law make clean energy supply chains that much more transparent? Thank you for your question, Congressman. <coughs> and just, you know, I, I do want to emphasize that the MESC mission cuts across um, many different parts of the energy sector industrial base. Uh, we've talked a lot about the battery and electric vehicle space today, but there's things like the grid, um, you know, particularly on, on transformers, uh, high voltage DC cir uh, um, circuits, uh, solar. Um, hydrogen fuel cells, platinum group metals, things of that nature that are very important. And we have programs in place are, are being executed that would actually fill key gaps within the manufacturing supply chain in the United States um, across those sectors plus more. Um, I, I will want to emphasize, too, we, we have a lot of... Um, a, a lot of focus on small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, manufacturing enterprises across the nation. When we really think about small and medium-sized enterprises, you're really talking about 99% of the jobs in the United States, manufacturing jobs in the United States. So it's so important for us to support our entrepreneurs in the small and medium enterprise, uh, manufacturing enterprises as well. So, you know, our, our support cuts across the energy sector industrial base. Uh, we are continuing to do the modeling, mapping, and analysis necessary to understand where we should um, focus our, 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 you know, our resources. And I, I'm thankful for the, for the billions of dollars we have, but we need to also understand that this is a long-term play, and we need a consistent effort um, for, for decades to make sure that we, we seize this moment and capture as much of the clean energy manufacturing base as we possibly can as a nation. Right. That's a very good point. And last year, DOE published a clean energy supply chain strategy with pillars aimed at uh, improving supply chains, including enhancing trace traceability and other steps to better protect human rights. So how is MESC implementing this strategy and working with interagency partners to ensure awardees are upholding labor and environmental standards and protecting human rights? Um, so... Um you know, part of, particularly in the battery manufacturing grant program, um, which actually um, uh, has uh, um, support in the minerals and, and, and refined materials area, um, and particularly separating key mi minerals from extracted feedstocks, um, part of our evaluation process is to understand where those extracted feedstocks come from and, and that they are... Um, and environmentally sustainable, um, that they, um, uh, wherever those feedstocks come from, that it's, um, you know, those feedstocks are, are, are procured by, by um, you know, um, groups that 
value human rights in, in the extraction process. So that's part of our evaluation. We also have a federal consortium for advanced batteries that's, that has a working group on battery materials and minerals um, that's also looking at environmentally sustainable um, governance of, of uh, extracted, extracted feedstocks. And we are launching, uh, the president has launched uh, the Advanced Battery Materials Initiative, which has a focus for accelerating permitting in an in environmentally sustainable and safe way. Well, thank you. With that, I believe I yield back. I have other questions. We'll submit those to the uh, subcommittee. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. Uh, seeing no further members wishing to ask questions, I would like to thank our witness for being here today. I would also uh, hope to get your commitment that you will answer the questions that we had about the vetting process since they said we'll let you know after the vetting process is over, that appears to be over for at least those first, that first tranche. And if you could get us that information, I would appreciate it. Also, you're probably going to get a written question about how do we get the lithia out of the water because both <laughs> Ms. Castor and myself, the ranking member, have uh, areas in our, area, in our region that are known as the lithia springs. And uh, if it's that valuable, how do we get it out of the water? Because unlike the Salton Sea, ours is not evaporating and staying. Ours is going downstream if we don't catch it. Anyway, that being said, in pursuant to committee rules, I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record. And I ask that witnesses submit their response within 10 business days upon receipt of the questions. Did you have something since I made a comment? Did you have another comment? Okay. And without objection, the subcommittee is adjourned. Thank you. Great.